There's a very valid reason why mainstream science-based medicine is distrusted and hated by a lot of people. And I empathize with them. What do you think? Is science-based medicine good or bad? Hi, this is Aditya Menon and you're watching me on The Lateral Enquirer. In this episode, we will pick out all the negatives that come along with mainstream science-based healthcare and understand how these negatives are the main reasons for all that legitimate suspicion. Multiple topics will be covered and therefore the whole video has been split into sections. You should be able to jump between sections on the timeline and all of it is listed in the description below as well. What you see on the screen now is the latest physician's pledge that is part of a ritual established by the World Medical Association. It was intended as a revision of the traditional Hippocratic Oath that was in practice earlier. Every mainstream medical practitioner makes a vow the day she or he gets the title of a doctor. But how many physicians actually live up to the words in that promise? In its various forms through the ages, as it evolved, the pledge lists out that they will not overtreat, will not be nihilistic, will be empathetic, will show sympathy, will be mindful of the economic stability of the sick and their family. But is that what we observe? The ones most of us meet, the physicians and the private hospitals they practice in, are those who are impersonal and without any emotion, staying detached by not even addressing the sick by their name. Their medical staff calls out to the sick as patients and the family as attenders. The doctors have very little tolerance to explain the diagnosis and treats the sick like ignorant fools, writes out prescriptions most often with expensive drugs, even though cheaper alternatives may exist, because they have to show billing to the hospital they are attached to or that the doctor's last family vacation was sponsored by that expensive drug manufacturer. Often the doctor may recommend unnecessary and expensive tests at their hospital or from specific labs from where the doctor gets a kickback. How many times have you heard stories of the sick being milked of all their savings in the name of treatment? Every one of those instances that I just listed has happened to us at some point in our lives. When my father was suffering from complications arising out of colon cancer and needed surgery, the gastroenterologist who was overseeing my father's case would charge exorbitant consultation fees each time he visited my dad in recovery, despite the only thing he ever did was to refer my dad to a competent surgeon. But is every medical practitioner the same? I have been fortunate enough to see the other side as well. I did not want to mention names, but among all the good physicians I have met in my life, I must share with you the name of one in honor of his memory. He passed away recently, the late Dr. Subhash Chandra, a cardiologist from Bangalore. In the early days when I was a struggling actor, I was diagnosed with an infection of the heart called endocarditis. Without being charged a single rupee, he provided me with the best of facilities at his hospital for a whole month till I was cured. It was an expensive course. He could have chosen not to treat me and let me die, but he did not. Why? There are many other doctors who in my life from time to time have helped me tide over illnesses. In my dad's case too, there was a nephrologist who advised against surgery. In my mom's case, there was a cardiac surgeon who advised against an expensive procedure. Why did they not try to rob me by providing me services that will not work? My family was ready to pay whatever it took to keep them alive. I bring this up to point out that in the crowd of all those mainstream medical practitioner crooks out there, there are many who live up to the pledge they took up on the days of their graduation. But how did the mainstream science-based medical system itself get a bad name? Is it possible that there is a link between the unethical practices in the system and the distrust in the system itself? How was the link created and exploited? Who are the ones who stand to benefit by defaming a system of medicine that was based on science and not faith or tradition? I'm sure many of you must have heard the word allopathy. Do you know what that means? It is a word that was invented in the year 1810 by Samuel Hahnemann, the man who conjured homeopathy. It was the antonym of the word he created for his own system of treatment. Allopathy was the opposite of homeopathy. So technically, Going by the definition intended by the man who invented the word, other forms of healthcare that practice methods like bloodletting during his period, also found in Ayurveda, 
Rakta Mokshana, it's called there, are the allopathy he is talking about. Science-based medicine was in its infancy then and did not even exist the way we know it today. But it would appear that over time, all the non-scientific systems that stood to lose by the advancements of science-based medicines ganged up and started using the word allopathy in a derogatory way to define science-based medicine. It seems not to have stopped with childish name-calling. The aggrieved systems saw an opportunity in the pent-up resentment people had against mainstream medicine. They manipulated this anger by indulging in misinformation against science-based medicine. These systems started claiming allopathy is unnatural and that allopathy treats the disease but we heal the body. They took on this offensive stance because new discoveries and better understanding of the human body through science-based medicine started demonstrating that other systems lacked scientific evidence for their claims and often were dangerous and fatal. So how much truth is there in claims that science-based medicines have side effects? The claim is absolutely true. Anything you put into the body will have a side effect on you, even food. For instance, if you consume too much carbohydrates, then the long-term side effect is a condition called diabetes. If you eat too many carrots or other foods high in beta-carotene, you will develop a side effect called carotonemia, a yellowish discoloration of the skin. Too much water can cause a side effect called hyponatremia and you will end up in hospital or dead. Just like long-term or excess consumption of regular food and even water has side effects, long-term or excess intake of science-based medicine too has side effects. At times, even short-term use of science-based medicines have terrible side effects. But a very important point to understand in this scenario is that these side effects are documented and reported by that very same science-based medicine itself. Every report of ill effects created by science-based medicine is provided by researchers who are part of studying these very science-based medicines. So why are they pointing fingers at themselves? It is because evidence is the backbone of science-based medicine. Every drug that is introduced into the market must go through stringent tests and trials where every effect of the drug has to get noted. In addition to positive effects, if there is a negative side effect observed during trials, that too needs to be reported. What if the drug manufacturer conceals the truth about side effects, you may ask? For this, one needs to understand how a drug acquires scientific validation through randomized clinical trials. But an even more important factor in this whole system is a process called peer review. This is where other science professionals will try and rip the claims apart. Every time a particular drug is announced by a pharmaceutical company, competitors of that company will conduct their own trials with this drug to try and find faults not reported by the announcing company. It's a checks and balances structure. This makes it highly unlikely that negative side effects can be concealed. Even after the drug is approved, it continues to be vetted where after prolonged periods of usage by people it's prescribed to, long-term side effects are also noted. Does such a system exist in any alternative or traditional medicine camps where they strive for scientific validation through randomized clinical trials and peer review? For instance, when someone says Panchagavya, an Ayurvedic concoction that contains cow excreta like urine and feces, can cure cancer. This is scientific. What is wrong? No, no, it's true. Gaumutra, I am a cancer patient. I have Gaumutra and Panchagavya from my own ashadiyon. I have done my own cancer. Is there anyone trying to verify or disprove it? So why do science-based medical practitioners prescribe drugs with side effects? Let me give you an exaggerated example to explain this. Suppose you are brought into the emergency room with gangrene in your foot. You will have only two choices. One is to amputate your foot and the other is to die. What would you choose? To lose a foot or to lose your life? If you chose losing a foot, then that answers why doctors may knowingly prescribe drugs with adverse side effects. The drug quinine is a classic example of this. Malaria was a disease that killed millions of people through the ages and was found on every continent except Antarctica. Till 1944, quinine was the only drug that could help fight malaria till safer alternatives were synthesized. But it came with terrible side effects in some people. Among its adverse effects were kidney failure and liver failure. Now, if you were a doctor and you're presented with a person suffering from malaria, what would you choose? 
Prescribe a medicine with known side effects that will increase the person's lifespan but may damage the person's organs or let the person die without any treatment there and then. It is important to note that malaria, just like today's COVID-19, did not kill everyone it infected. It would appear that it is these who survived out of their own natural immunity that most traditional systems held up as evidence of their concoctions having worked, like how they are today doing with Kapasura Kudini. Fact is that despite traditional medicine trying to treat malaria for centuries, it was only quinine which showed evidence of effect. However, I do agree that it is wrong if the doctor does not explain the negative effects of the drug to you before he prescribes it. The decision on whether to take the drug or not should lie in the hands of the one who is taking it. The good part is that there is constant research for new drugs with lesser side effects to treat the same disease. And when that happens, the older drug is less used, like in the case of quinine, after the discovery of the safer synthetic chloroquine for treating malaria. Even surgical procedures get better for treating the same condition like with the advent of angioplasty and vascular stenting that earlier required bypass surgery for treating blocked arteries. An often heard argument by people opposed to science-based medicine is that allopathic medicines are all chemicals. Well, technically everything is a chemical, including plain water. The reason this argument started is perhaps because science-based medicines identify an isolated active ingredient by its chemical name. But it is also true that most often science-based medicines separate active ingredients from natural sources like plants and organisms. In fact, many cures prescribed by science-based medicine comes from natural sources like penicillin, an antibiotic extracted from a natural fungus, or quinine, the anti-malaria drug extracted from the bark of the cinchoa tree. Here is a story of a very popular drug that was part of traditional medicine, but is now science-based medicine. For centuries, from ancient Egyptians to recent Europeans, when one had a headache, they would boil the bark of the willow tree and drink it as a tea. It was observed that it alleviated pain just as their traditional medicine claimed it would. So science-based medicine studied it and discovered that there is a chemical called salicin present in the bark along with various chemicals. Then they discovered that salicin was metabolized by the body to create salicylic acid and it was this that relieved pain. It was further improved upon to reduce adverse side effects and a synthetic version called acetyl salicylic acid was invented by a chemist working for Bayer Pharmaceuticals. This went on to becoming the world famous aspirin. The story of quinine in treating malaria is also similar. It was borrowed from the traditional medicine of ancient Peruvians. These two are examples where the raw form of the plant is effective but is improved upon to reduce adverse side effects through purification. But what if the raw form is not strong enough and larger practically impossible doses are required? Close to home we have the best example for this scenario, a chemical called curcumin that is isolated from a spice found in every Indian kitchen, turmeric. Initial studies have shown promise that consuming 1000 milligrams of curcumin a day will help non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Curcumin is found in turmeric and makes up only 2 to 5% of the total spice. Now here is where you can understand the importance of isolating a chemical that is the active ingredient and concentrating it to increase dosage. So if anyone tries to convince you that you can protect your liver by drinking a glass of milk with a spoonful of turmeric in it is either ignorant or is lying to you. These examples of science-based medicine using plant extracts by improving upon existing traditional medicines point us to a remarkably interesting facet which is that the system is not averse to any other form of medicine. Science-based medicine is not anybody's enemy. All it needs is evidence. If there is scientific evidence to a cure from some disease in any traditional medicine, before you know it, it will be adopted and owned by science-based medicine. And such a medicine will cease to be alternative medicine anymore. Do you know what they call alternative medicine that's been proved to work? Medicine. <laughs> but you must have heard of Big Pharma. What is that? It is a concept where there is a lot of conspiracy theories that are being floated. In a nutshell, the theory proposes that Big Pharma is a handful of rich drug manufacturing companies collaborating to create new illnesses. 
Big Pharma apparently suppresses traditional medicines and everyday foods or spices, which supposedly could otherwise provide simple cures for these illnesses. And it is claimed that Big Pharma willfully introduces dangerous drugs with terrible side effects into the market with the sole aim of stealing your money. These conspiracy theorists are people like the ones who believe the earth is flat, the moon landings never happened, aliens built the pyramids, 5G technology is for mind control, and so on. These are the people who send you those WhatsApp forwards telling you that drinking lemon juice is enough to kill cancer cells or that tying neem leaves on your air conditioning vent will neutralize the coronavirus. I would not take them seriously, but the theorists will paint anyone who does not agree with them a stooge who is being paid by Big Pharma. For this video, I may also be accused of it, but big pharmaceutical companies do exist. They have clout to influence government decisions through powerful lobbying. Should we fear them? I think we should fear any big business, including those that make traditional medicine like Patanjali Ayurveda. They are all in it only to make money. But when it comes to science-based medicine, India has a huge advantage where Big Pharma, even if it does exist, as per the conspiracy theory, cannot impact us. In the 1960s, when India had a government with scientific temper, there was a huge push to establish an indigenous pharmaceuticals industry that will break our dependence on any foreign powers. 60 years later, India today is the largest generic drug manufacturer and exporter in the world. Generic drugs are identical to those drugs discovered by big pharmaceutical companies in the West with the same active ingredients, but without their brand name. To give you an example, the 2013 documentary Fire in the Blood details how India alone spearheaded a crusade in which generic drug manufacturing company Cipla from India took the cost of treating a person who is HIV positive with antiretroviral drugs from $15,000 per patient per year to just $100 per patient per year. There is a phenomenon called illusionary truth. When a false statement is repeated over and over again, at some point people tend to believe it is true. For me, the bottom line is about the system of medicine itself, science-based healthcare versus all other forms of healthcare. There is no denying that there is a concentrated effort by vested interests to deride science-based systems and give oxygen to faith-based pseudoscientific systems. Sadly, we are living in strange times where belief and superstitions surpass rational assessments. We are told that lighting lamps will decimate the coronavirus. Influential icons in society are seen propagating absurd ideas, claiming banging plates and sound vibrations will destroy the potency of a virus. These relentless fake information strategies by the non-scientific healthcare camps manage to create a sense of paranoia among many people. Take for instance the crisis of COVID-19. It is a new disease and science-based medicine is still learning because of which they are unable to provide a definitive answer on how to treat it. Faith and tradition-based systems manipulate the sincere stance to make it appear that science-based medicine is useless and knows nothing. But even those who distrust science-based medicine cannot abandon it because one aspect of it remains irreplaceable, emergency healthcare and surgery. None of the alternative cures could even remotely attempt to enter that arena. Even this lady, who claimed Panchagavya had cured her, was indulging in what is called false cause fallacy. She had previously undergone a bilateral mastectomy to prevent recurrence of her cancer in 2008 at the Ram Manohar Lohia Institute of Medical Sciences in Lucknow. The alternative systems were successful only so long as the one receiving treatment from them was not in any immediate grave danger. They flourished within this boundary while often advising their customers to continue taking the science-based medicines that were prescribed to them while parallelly ingesting the alternative concoctions they prescribe. This way, if the person got better, they can take credit for it. And if they did not, then they can blame it on science-based medicine. There is a popular argument from antiquity, which implies that a belief is true because the belief has been around for thousands of years. Not necessarily. There are plenty of examples where older beliefs are replaced by new ones. 
For thousands of years, people believed the earth was flat. Not just in the West, but in India as well. But today, we have abandoned that in the face of evidence and adopted the new understanding that the earth is a sphere. I think it's about time we start scrutinizing all ancient beliefs of healthcare and look for scientific evidence to prove these claims are true. And if there is no evidence, we must abandon it. Science-based medicine has a long way to go, but it has come a long way too. The average human lifespans have increased by tens of years. So why do we see more incidences of cancer these days, one might ask. And the answer to that lies in the inevitability of death. One must eventually die of some cause. So as we keep finding cures for more diseases, people get funneled towards diseases we still haven't found a proper cure for. Cancer lies on that frontier. I have lost both my parents despite intervention from science-based medicine. But I also know that if it were not for intervention, I would have lost them much earlier. Not once have I had doubt about if or not things could have been done differently. We cannot fill gaps in knowledge that science has yet not found an answer to with untested claims of faith or tradition-based medicines. There are so many illnesses that had no solution throughout history in the list of all those that were dealt with only after science-based medicine evolved. Think about it. Where were these ancient traditional healthcare systems when smallpox was around? Hmm? I hope you enjoyed watching this episode as much as I enjoyed making it. Asking questions and finding evidence-based answers to it have been the most satisfying moments of my life. I know, everyone has a belief and I'm not trying to change you, but I am willing to change if I'm wrong. So please, question me and point out any error you feel I may have made in my research, but with evidence, and I will gladly correct myself. I cannot stress enough about the importance of liking and sharing this video, so please do subscribe and ask your friends to join in too. That's it for now. Till we meet again on the next episode, this is Aditya Menon on The Lateral Enquirer. Cheers. Whoa.